All right, special guest is Victor, uh, one of the owners of Worldwide, joining us yet again. Uh, this time it's building your aquarium needs versus wants. Yes. This is a great topic because there's a never ending list of gear. Yes. In fact, I think there's like 7,000 SKUs uh, right behind us in the back here of uh, some things that are needs and some things that are wants. I can't wait to hear what your opinions are. Yeah. But you broke them out into needs, starting with needs. We have to get to the wants later. Number one is it needs to start with clean water. Needs. Needs. Um, you're either going to need an arrow machine or you're going to need containers if you have a local fish store. Uh, if you do want to do a reef tank, I highly recommend that. You do not want to do it with tap water and a dechlorinator. If it's fish only, maybe you can get away with it. But that's the old school way of thinking. You know, one of the big surprises, like, you know, you think of RO and you always go to like, well, it's filled with ammonia. It's filled with uh, nitrate and phosphate yeah. and chlorine and all other stuff. Okay. We tested uh, five different water sources here in Minneapolis from different, some of them from the river, some from wells and different locations all over. Okay. Three of them had 20 DKH water. 20? Yeah. Okay, so think about it, man. Like when you mix now with your black bucket Red Sea, I'm gonna start the tank with 33 DKH water when I mix the two together. So if the fresh water starts that high, you know, you're gonna add that in with your salt mix, man, it's gonna be a disaster. I'm like, you just don't even think, like some people say- I never that, thought of that. I, I, That's I, why I, you see my face, I'm like- 20 years until we saw the result, like, oh wow, man, I had no clue it could be that high, right? And in fact, you see people complain, like, why do you strip all the stuff out only to back, add it back in? Well, I strip it all out so that when I do add it back in with my salt mix, it goes to the right level. To the right level, yeah. not 30. So forget all the poisons and nutrients and toxins and all that stuff, man. Like, dude, I just want the chemistry to be right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I agree. Need is a RO unit and... Or uh, buckets to go get your water at the fish store. Oh, yeah. You got a local store. You can just go there and pick it up. You don't want to mess around with it. That's specifically good. Like if you got a smaller tank that's manageable, I can go get two buckets and it'll actually ask me like most of the month. Mm. Uh, or I could go like an office tank, that kind of stuff, man. I, I think those are great, great, great solutions. So yeah. there you go. Uh, RODI, almost everybody's been doing this for any period of time would agree with you needs. Yeah. All right. What else? <laughs> Another note what you need is you actually need a glass box. Yes, you do. <laughs> this a look, what we're just talking about it right now is just, when setting up an aquarium, what are the things that you have to have? Without them, you will not make it happen. Your box aquarium. Okay, it says here, don't be cheap. The glass is likely to cost significantly less than the rest of the build. Now, you wouldn't think that day one. You think you're setting up an aquarium, the aquarium's gonna be the big cost, but you'll find out it's not. <laughs> I've been there before when, when I was a lot younger, 20 years ago. Walk into a fish store, you see a 300 gallon tank, you fall in love with it. You save your pennies, you buy the tank, and little that you know, that's 10% of your cost. I you mean, haven't in got into end, it. You think you got your fish tank already. And that's even more true today because, like, you know, corals aren't cheap. Yeah. You know, like 20 years ago, they, they were, were a lot cheaper. Like, the hobby wasn't as like advanced and there weren't any, as many people in the hobby. There wasn't as demand, much demand for this stuff. Yeah. Now the demand's up for this stuff, man. It is like, it's just not. It's just not the cheapest thing ever to get an animal that lives in Fiji to come to your house. No, it's incredible yeah. how long we have come in this hobby in the past 20, 25 years. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the things you say is also weigh the pros and cons. What will you lose if the glass box doesn't hold water anymore? So there, what you're getting at here is there's quality of these glass boxes as well? Yes. Okay, so what are your favorite ones? Uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of our water boxes. It's been working out pretty good. We've been dealing with them for about three, four years. We've been using uh, the custom tanks from Planet Aquariums. Um, Bob and Karen is a couple out of Miami. They've been building tanks for 35, 40 years. They did all of our custom tanks. Those are three companies that I've been dealing for a while and um, I've been having great results. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of good brands out there. You can find like, there's a surprise, especially in places like Florida and like LA. There's actually a lot of surprising, like kind of smaller boutique places that make tanks. Yes. Uh, then you got your planet aquariums. You have your water box. Yeah. You have uh, Aqua Perfecto. Forest is making these things, shipping them in from uh, like Europe. Mm. Uh, you have uh, uh, your Red Seas. You have uh, even Fiji Cube, a local here in Minneapolis. Cat uh, Aquariums. Yep. JBJ. Yeah. I read the reviews. I see the other people that are happy with them. 
Uh, one of the things that I'd look for in, in most of these tanks is, you know, look at like how many overflows do they have? Do they come with a sump? Am I happy with that sump? You know, what are the reviews like? What are yeah. people complaining about? Yep, exactly. Because uh, if those people are complaining, you can decide if that thing actually matters to you or not. Yes. Uh, most of them are, you know, have enough re reviews you can do that. But, uh, you know, back in the day, we all bought the little black trim tanks. You know, that yeah. was just kind of what we all Like did. the old school from Aquion, mm -hmm. Perfecto, Marine Land. And, you know, if I had a stand and a hood, I might still buy those in some cases because you're going to hide the trim and everything anyway. I like them. Yeah, and they're inexpensive and I can spend the money somewhere else, you know. Yeah. If I don't have a hood on it, it's, I have a hard time with it. I have a hard time now seeing the black. I got you. Yeah. Top, but it's just not meant to be that way. Actually, one of my favorite tanks from them is, uh, uh, is uh, the, I think it's like a 300 deep dimension they or no something. They no longer do it. They don't make that one anymore. So, so <laughs> they, they got rid of the deep dimension, the 150, the 200, the 250, and the 300. They also got rid of the 265, the 220. The biggest tank they make now is the 180. Oh, so I, it's funny. I just had this conversation with Tom Fisk, one of the main reps in Florida for um, Marineland, uh, Perfecto Manufacturing for Aquariums. I was, you know, it's so funny. I was just thinking about buying one of these for a fish-only tank. <laughs> so you took this away from me. No, they don't. So so now they still make the 5, the 10, the 20, the 30, the 40 breather, 55. They do the 75, the 90, the 120, the 125, and the 180. That's it. So that's one of the things I think about, too, here is when you're needed, like, is tank. For me, for a reef tank, depth should be deeper than it is tall, or at least the same, never the inverse. I'm sad when Marineland stopped making those tanks. If any of you guys work for Marineland and you're listening to this, bring them back. I know they had a lot of issues. There was some tanks leaking, and then they decide to get rid of them. But they lasted 10 years. No one else was making tanks this nice, like where you can order them, you know? That 300 deep dimension was 6 feet, 3 feet deep, 27 inches tall. It was gorgeous. So glass box, uh, essential, uh, do your research on it. Yep. Uh, the next one, essential for a reef tank, believe it or not, lights. Lights. You cannot do a reef tank without lighting. Mm -hmm. So that's super important. I mean, again, we're just mentioning all the stuff that without this, you will not make it happen. There's many, many options. Ryan, you're better than me. You know all the brands out there. We got Kessel. We got Aqua Illumination. We got uh, Ecotech lights, uh, Radiance. Uh, we got the Sky Lights. Uh, we got the lights from um, Tulio. What's his name? Um, Reef uh, Brights. Reef Brights. Reef Brights. Um, did, I, did I miss some? We I got black guess, boxes yeah. from China. Mm -hmm. You can still buy T5s. Metal highlights, I think they're pretty much obsolete. I don't even know where you can get bulbs anymore. Highlights are, nobody wants to deal with the heat. So yeah. like they're pretty, and the reflectors are now, even the reflectors that are out there now, like the good reflectors were these big giant luminarchs and stuff like this. So like they're kind of hard to find now. Like it, it's, it's just become old technology. I would call it 0 0.0001 on new installs. But the people that already have them installed will hold on to them for the rest of their life. Yeah. You know? uh, so uh, it says here, though, you say all lights work. They just work differently, uh, but don't expect them to do the same job. Yeah. Right? So any thoughts on that? Uh, it's just basically if you get a T5 or if you, like I was talking about, if you get metal highlights or LED, they all can work a little bit different. Mainly right now, everyone seems to be using LEDs because you can adjust them to, to be as strong as metal highlight or to get the color that the T5 com color combination with the bulbs that you were doing, they will give you. You remember back then where you have a ATI fixture with 12 bulbs mm -hmm. and you get the purple lights and the blue lights and you get one green and a bunch of whites and mix them all up. Yeah. I, I can tell you as uh, somebody who sells a lot of these things, uh, less than 1% are buying new T5 fixtures, mm -hmm. but there's still an enormous amount. In fact, the last I looked, it was like, 15,000 uh, bulbs we sold in, wow. the, in, the, uh, in the last year. But is it going down every year? A little bit, a little? I haven't measured. I mean, presumably because nobody's buying the fixtures anymore. Yeah. Okay? But uh, it, people have old ones. But you know what's coming now a lot? Hybrid lighting. A lot of people are starting to do uh, the radiant lights in the middle, and then they put like two T5s on each end. I, I've <clears> been <throat> doing that with Kessels for as long as I can remember. Yeah. I'm now swapping out the T5s with the uh, LED strips because the LED strips what, technology the ones from, is uh, aqua lamination. What are they called? The blades? The blades. Uh, I'm looking for any option that has a wide blue spectrum. Gotcha. And so, like, I don't want to nerd out on this forever, but 
I want to hit chlorophyll A, I want to hit chlorophyll C2, and I want to hit perdenin and, and the carotenoids. This is where the coral collects energy. Now, this is one of the things, before we get too nerdy on this, actually, yeah. you've told me earlier on that corals are amazingly adaptive creatures. Yes, right? they are. They'll adapt to almost anything, right? <clears throat> so just to add a little color, and what, like I've talked to some biologists on this, and this is basically what we believe is happening, is if you give the coral, the sun, which is a basically balanced amount of blue light and all the different spectrums, it's pretty close to balance. Okay. Well, that's, it doesn't need to adapt to that. And so there's a lot of old like technology that you know, kind of did that. And so like you just turned it on, plugged it in the wall and it worked. Yeah. Now with LED technology, <laughs> there was like a little bit more peaky and it would peak not necessarily chlorophyll A, it'd peak at chlorophyll C2. And that doesn't mean that it won't adapt to that, it will. And it will actually change the amount of chlorophyll A and C2 and different carotenoids to adapt to the light that is being provided to it, right? But like, it's gonna take a while. Like, and that's why like you see, if you use like a poor LED light, plug it in, they won't just like kick the bucket day one, but it's gonna kind of not do a whole lot for the next nine months. And then one day, nine months, all of a sudden they'll start to behave like other corals and start to grow, right? That is the amazingly adaptive creature part of this. And also that component of when you're, uh, don't keep switching it up. Because every time you switch those switches, you're causing it to readapt every time. It's very funny you say that because when we first got LEDs, I mean, the LED craze has been going on for about 12, 13 years now. I remember in 2011, I got Radeon 1s and I switched my whole store from metal highlights and T5s to Radeon 1s. I lasted three months. I didn't want nothing to do with those lights. I literally went back to my T5s. Is it Radeon Gen 1s? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it wasn't, but it, I can't blame Radeon Gen 1s. I think what, what, what needed to be blamed, there wasn't enough experience into the field of LEDs, and LEDs were new to us, so what's the first thing we wanted to do was make the tank, all the tanks be blue and just pop blue and very bright, and we didn't know the intensity of these LEDs because we're used to what our eye can see, and it was a lot stronger. And then... It, the, it took a while for the corals to adapt because we didn't have the patience and we keep changing the colors because we never had a, a light or a toy per se where you can play with the color. Before it was, hey, here's your metal highlight, turn it on and off. And if you got T5, the only way to play with the colors, it was just with a different color combination of bulbs, which the options were four or five bulbs. Mm -hmm. So the options were minimal compared to this new radiant light that came in. So what we were doing, we weren't putting a lot of white, we are putting a lot of blue because the corals look better. And then the corals started, the reds were turning orange. The corals weren't happy. We didn't give them enough time to adapt. Well, in, we you quit know, in three months. We quit in three months instead yeah. of like getting it there. So uh, part of the reason for that is back Gen 1, I mean, you're talking like a decade ago. A decade ago, right? yeah. uh, at least. Uh, is the reason that that was happening in some cases is just because uh, the royal blue and the cool white LEDs were the only ones really available. And so when we're talking about hitting chlorophyll A and C2 and all that other nerdy we stuff, hit we couldn't hit it because it's too expensive. The, the LEDs just didn't even exist. To the eye, it still looked blue and it still yeah. looked like the same lights, but it, it wasn't, wasn't hitting the same, the same biology, right? Today's lights, absolutely. I shouldn't say all of today's lights. Some of today's lights absolutely do that now. They span the whole gap. Uh, and that's why when you said this, it really hit home for me, which is all lights work. It's true. Uh, they all just work differently, but don't expect them to do all do this, do the same job. Right. Which is the heart of that. Like, don't think that just because it has some blue light, they're all the same. Yeah. Uh, do it intelligently. And if I was looking to somebody and I was just telling them like what to look for in, you know, a necessity of getting the best light that they can get inside of their budget, Get the widest blue band you can get. And we're talking from like this like violet kind of 390, 400 range all the way to this light blue range and try to get one that's kind of balanced or gives you the ability to tune it so it's kind of balanced. Yeah. And it will match natural sunlight. And then when you turn the thing on, you'll hopefully won't works. have to adapt to it as much and it'll be a much better solution for you. All right, next one here uh, is uh, in the needs column is water movement yes. and you said the same thing they all work differently expect them to don't expect them to do the same job though um power heads in general you know uh you got ecotech power heads you got the jerry power heads they move tons of water technology tons too 
has come a long way. You remember 15, 20 years ago what it was to deliver flow? I mean, think about it. It was Maxi Jets. You know? <laughs> yeah, Maxi Jet. I mean, Tonsi came out 15, 20 years ago. They were, but they were very expensive back then. Mm -hmm. And people were literally using Maxi Jets for flow. I mean, literally 295 gallons. <laughs> I was too. And if you want to go back longer, they used to be used as return pumps. Oh, man. Did well, you know that? That's what they used to be used originally. Okay, so uh, going back to that period of time, 20 years ago for me, is uh, uh, I installed four maxi jets on the side of my tank, and I had those little high door, like rotating yes. deflector things on I there know that you're jammed about. all the time. Okay, and then everybody swore by Tunes's nobody was willing to buy them because they the maxi jet was like 25 bucks, and the Tunes thing was 250. You know, At least. Pump. Okay. Back then, yeah. That's where the uh, uh, maxi jet modification kits came from. They were good, know? those kits. Yeah, so like like people were were taking radio control boat props and turning their RO or their uh, their uh, maxi jet into basically a tunes with I some forgot about fittings. that. Okay, mm. that's where like I did that project, and then we started selling them out of my house. We put okay. those little kits together and sell them. I I couldn't believe it. We were selling 40, 50 of those kits a day. You know, and it was, I'm literally sawing these pieces in my basement, you know, trying to create them because it was actually really hard to find all those little pieces, the 316 welding yeah. rod and the carbon fiber things and all the yeah. other stuff. Uh, but all of a sudden now for another 25 bucks, you could turn your maxi jet into that, except we had plumbing fittings and it looked as wonky as you could yeah. believe. But man, did the tank the just totally transform. Transform uh, with that extra flow. Oh, transformed, man. Uh, and like, oh, now I get why people were buying this thing. Yeah, nice well, they flow. Yeah. yeah. So, so different flows can be different type of power heads, but it doesn't have to be necessarily power heads. People can do closed loops. You can put a pump in your um, your sump and just return them. Just a closed loop. Um, what is the name of the the sea swirls? You remember the sea swirls? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They have a little rotating. Do they still guy. make them? There's a guy there who does still make them, I believe. I've asked for him to make them for us because I like to put tuneses on them and the yeah. tunes can spin around, you know. Uh, it's kind of a side gig, so he's not really interested. I mean, when we mean a water movement, whatever, it can be a closed loop system, it can be power heads. I mean, have you ever seen when you go to a playground for kids and there's the bucket on top is getting full of water and when it gets to a certain point, it just tips over? Mm -hmm. I've oh, seen people do that in aquariums. Surge. Surge. surge I've, seen, yeah. I've seen people where they got a box above and the box has got a... Uh, a PVC on an angle, and when it gets to the top, the, the PVC gets full, and he just rushes into the tank, mm -hmm. delivering all the water. So there's diff di many different ways. In order for you to set up an aquarium, it's something that you need. It has to be water movement inside the aquarium, other than just your return pump. So You have to have flow inside the tank. Stitching a little bit of this together. Yeah. I had my little mm -hmm. maxi jets. Tank was doing okay. I put on the maxi jet mods, man. It went from 200 gallons an hour to 2,000 on each side. Tank just transforms. Corals open, right, right. the water's clear. Okay. Then fast forward like, I don't know, 15 years or something, uh, maybe okay. 13 years. I go to your facility for the first time, meet you and Josh, and you guys tell me we spend way more time perfecting flow than we protect, uh, perfect lighting. Lighting, you just get it right the first time, leave it alone. Yeah. Right? Flow is one thing you're never going to get right for. The, I mean, you always have to constantly adjust. Always. I've been reading a lot about flow in the last probably 18 months or so. Okay. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out why that experience really is that way. And, and it starts with this thing called the boundary layer, which is like right around your coral. It might look like this water's hitting it. But there's this like basically where the water hits a surface creates a uh, uh, like surf not surface tension. Uh, it creates uh, it just creates a, a low area of flow right around the edge of the coral everywhere where the water actually isn't moving. If you were able to see it, you'd actually see the water take like a hard right and go right around it. You know, so that water the kind of sits there. Okay, so in that coral now, the coral is, is has got photosynthesis going on. It's pulling the bicarbonate out of the water, spits off this hydrogen as part of that. The hydrogen reduces the pH within the coral. Now the coral can't precipitate its skeleton anymore. And the way that's getting rid of these uh, H pluses is water's hitting it. And it helped me diffuse out. So we're getting rid of all of that. It's the gas exchange. It's getting the oxygen in and out of the coral. It's getting yeah. that acidity in and out of the coral. It's bringing the nutrients to the coral. It's getting the Washing amino it off, acids all the to slimes the coral. of the coral. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> but like 
almost all of the biology of the coral, of getting the coral what it needs and helping the coral get rid of what it doesn't need is because the flow hit it enough that it broke the boundary layer. And in fact, when I, I didn't notice this before, but like you can see uh, it actually happen in your tank. Areas that get really good flow, the coral grows towards it. Yes. Be because the biology is better here. They're trying it's to able to get rid of the things it doesn't need and get the things it doesn't. And on this side of the coral where it doesn't get the perfect flow, actually it does grows way slower and has I noticed that too. Yeah, and it grows then funky. Now, if you were able to hit it from all sides, it would grow normal. Then the worst part about it, actually, then where there's no flow in the inner workings of the coral, dead. Funny you say that. Sometimes you can grow a frag and six months later... You see growth on one side and the other side is borderline receding. Like, mm -hmm. why can that be? It's flow. Flow. Uh, it's probably not lighting. Uh, it could be, but it's probably not so dark in one half the coral. That, but it's very easy to find areas where the uh, coral is blocked. And one of the things that, like, I don't <clears throat> think people think about it a lot. And this is actually another thing I learned from you guys is, uh, like, I was desperately trying to get out of Josh. Give me the 20 times multiplier, 50 times, 60 times multiplier oh, number yeah. that I can tell all of you. And he just like wouldn't do it. Uh, he's like, no, it's not as easy as that. No. Uh, I'm like, oh, come on. But people just really kind of want to know a zone. Then you, you just have to help, you know. Uh, and now I understand why. Because it is kind of like that. It's, you're going to really kind of be measuring more linear feet per second. You know, yeah. and so on this side of the coral, we're getting linear feet per second of like, you know, three feet a second or something. Okay. Well, the reason this one isn't growing over here is because it's getting a half a foot a second. OK, so now if you take that and think about the areas, well, all the corals on the front, man, they're getting your, your you know, your pumps are changing speed and they're moving they and they're probably all getting all that. But what about in all those little nooks and crannies and stuff and behind the other coral? They're getting like a tiny fraction of that. Like you got two islands. What about the corals that are in the middle of the islands? Like they're getting z like way, 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 way less. Yeah. And then you're expecting them to grow. And if you go look at them right now in your tank, you're like, oh, that's why those guys never grow. Now you don't. And, <laughs> and as the corals grow too, they become, they, be, they create a bigger problem because they start blocking the flow. Mm -hmm. Well, they will block like, to their that neighbor. That you have over there is huge. I mean, that's the reason why you say it never, ever ends. It's like, I designed the flow to the beginning, and now it looks perfect in this empty tank. Yeah. And now it all fills in with all these acros, and now i got to take a way better approach. And then you might get the flow, and then the flow's got to come out of our head, and the first coral is going to get a lot more, like you were saying. And sometimes that can be too much in order to deliver to the whole tank. And have you ever seen when Acropora gets too much flow and it gets their shape changes? Mm -hmm. It gets, like, flat. Yep, yep. Like, like real ridgery. Mm -hmm. It's... Looks weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so this is actually one of the things you said in here, too, which is, again, man, they all work differently. Don't expect them to do the same job. So for me, one of the problems that once the corals all fill in is getting flow over the top. And the top is where the most rapid photosynthesis is happening. It's also sometimes the hardest part to, to get flow to. It is without spilling water out. Gyre, right? Yeah. That laminar sheet of flow that goes over there once the tank fills out. I didn't maybe need this before, but now I do. That was a cool power hit when it came out like four or five years ago, whatever it was. I don't know how long has it been. Five years, I want to say. But it's different because you can put it close to the top without sucking the water and it moves tons of water. I Shoots it was right a, across the top and doesn't do the vortex. Yeah, I thought it was a great device between vortex and those. I mean, this. Okay, I have, have you seen job. the new one? The, no. Like the Gen 3, it must be? The double one? Is that what you're talking about? Okay, so that? yeah, now the, the gyre was kind of limited by the fact that it was a sheet of water that you could kind of like a 15 degree angle, high velocity water that could kind of shoot up or down, right? Yeah. Uh, now they changed it so the sides uh, have two pivots. So you can shoot it up here, up there, or, or down here, up there, and on this one, shoot down, then shoot up. And now they have these little like uh, inductor things that go on the top of them, and they can be uh, angled left to right now. When too. this came out. This came out like maybe a month and a half ago. Okay. Uh, and so like now you can aim the stuff left or right, up and down. It's like almost like four angleable power heads That's in one. That's cool. I'm going to have to play with that. And I have not put one in a tank yet, Like, uh, but I got two sitting on my desk that's going to get it into my tank. You probably saw it when you came in today. Uh, but like what a cool, and they're like wireless now. 
You don't necessarily need the little box anymore, oh, nice. too. Yeah, so you can do it like if you like apps and stuff. So um, one thing just got me thinking, um, I don't know why I just thought of this. When I first started in the hobby, I had a 92 corner tank. Mm -hmm. And I have four maxi jets, and I put them on the little Red Sea controller. You remember that old school Red Sea oh, controller? Oh, the on and off thing. Yeah, yeah. you plug yeah. them in the back, mm -hmm. and they will switch on the on. There was little, little different programs that they will work. Mm -hmm. And for me back then, that was a photo, and I was able to to, heck a, to get a heck of a so, flow on the tank by doing that. Uh, most of you guys have probably heard this before, but back when I had the MJ mods, uh, yeah. one of the people told me that, hey, don't use those types of things, because they only turn on and off they break every 30 em. seconds or something. They break them. And if you pay attention, it takes longer than 30 seconds to create a full current in the tank. Uh, you're just getting a second, just burst. Yeah. And so what I was told to do is, Turn one on for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And switch to the Turn the other minutes. one on for 20 minutes. Turn then this one together. Off and together. And then just keep cycling. So it goes this way, it goes that way, then turbulence. And it worked really, really well. Now we got like really more advanced than that. But yeah. uh, that was cool too. Uh, so also, before we move off of the power heads, like there's things like the Nero's and the uh, Vortex that go in the front that create that shifting kind yeah. of turbulence. But also, probably the most underappreciated uh, power head out there, the tunes. Yeah. Because uh, you can aim it where you want it. Uh, what else can you do to actually get it in those weird little pockets? People don't talk about enough about tunes. No, they it don't. It seems like it's more of a European market, but I mean, that power has been around for over 20 years. It's the power head to go to. It's, it's so easy to get it in those little isolated areas. It's also, by the way, uh, there's one specific model called the 6095. It has this big old mouth on it, and the flow that comes out of it is ultra wide angle. So it's still doing the same 2,000 gallons, but instead of shooting a laser beam across the tank, it's just like shooting this kind of slow moving cloud out it. So like LPS tanks and stuff like that, uh, where you just kind of want it to sway instead of getting pounded. Yeah. Uh, cool option, right tool, right job. Cool. All right. I'm gonna check it out. Next one, 6095. Uh, next one is the return pump is a need. Yes. Obviously. Again, I was saying earlier, back in the days, people used to use maxi jets as a return pump. Uh, one pump has been around for a long time. It's the mag pump. Mag drives? Yeah, mag drive. How long have they been those things around? I haven't used one in probably 15 years, but they were definitely on my beginner tanks, all of them. They're still the same thing. They create a little bit too much heat, but other than that, it's a four pump's been around. This is the problem that I have with yeah. that. The rust. The oh, yeah. Noise, man. The the home and noise. Home, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, you can use um, external pumps, but that's for larger tanks. Now you got the Vectra pump, which is what they got the the one, the two, and the three, the large, medium, mm -hmm. and small. I think they work great. Um, they're adjustable now. Before they weren't. Before you plug them in and you get one set of flow. Now you can play if you feel like you need more flow, if you need a little less. You know what I like to adjust them for? What? Is because, you know, you do the Herbie overflow that creates that full siphon in the back. Yes. But eventually things just change. I hate those overflows, by the way. Josh, yeah. you're listening. <laughs> they gurgle or whatever. Uh, now I just go, instead of like trying to like monkey with that stupid valve. You play with I the, just go up to the, the intensity, the intensity of the pump. pit it one, it goes up one, sound goes away. Yep. Uh, Funny you said I'm having that issue in my office right now. That's why I'm talking to you, Josh. <laughs> Yeah, the gurgle noise. Like I don't want it because when you when you go and change the the little ball valve, you don't really know how much or the gate valve how much you're doing, and it takes like a you know ten minutes. To I'm stabilize. just old school. I like my doors to drain up down by gravity. They're quiet. I don't understand why you need a quieter or to have a backup drain. I'm I'm sorry. Okay, just. you know why I bet it is is because in a commercial facility, the noise just really isn't that pop. But if it's in my bedroom or my living room, it drives you crazy. Silence is the only option. I, it needs to be quiet, man. Gotcha. Like, the only thing I ever want to hear is like the little bit of water. Lapping, lapping of the waves or something, man. Just like the little bit of sounds of trickles and stuff. I gotcha. don't want to hear gurgles, and I don't want right. to hear the electric. Mm, you know, I don't want any of that. I, I, you're actually paying for some of those things, I gotcha. but uh, I prefer not. All right. In almost every case. Uh, yeah. So the next one. This is an interesting one. Uh, this has a little debate to it. Uh, is uh, uh, needs rock, and you say we find live to be the best, dry with ample time. I agree 100. percent So very funny. Um, Josh set up a tank 11, 12 months ago, 
And he did it all with mature media, like carbon reactor media that has been sitting on water for a long, long time, even with Coraline. And rocks that have been sitting there for a long time. I started my tank a month or two after him. And I started with dry Marco rock and dry media. And it took me six months before I can even get that tank to take off. And his tank today, he just made a video. If you want to go see it on our YouTube channel, he made a video. Was maybe. this a bare bottom tank? No, no, no. Oh. So he did this tank maybe 11 months ago, and we just did a video last month. It says Josh SPS dominated tank. Things looking amazing in 11 months from literally frags. My tank now in month nine is just doing okay. It's just finally I can put Acroporas and some frags. So I'm literally six months behind him mm -hmm. on growth based on just getting live rock that is already ready to rock and roll, you know? Okay, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, this this debate ebbs and flows. You go one way, you go the other yeah. way. And like live rock was terrible because it has all these pests on it. Dry rock's terrible because it's really hard to do. Let me rephrase you know? this real quick. I'm sorry to cut you off. On, on What we mean by live rock is main, main rock that we have in water for a long time. Mm -hmm. So we rarely dealing with live rock. It's just I know there's some lately it's been some Indonesia rock being pulled out again, some Australian rock. Mm. But it just to me it just comes too dirty and it's too much work to do. I would say that there is a few types of live rock. One is the one you just described, which boggles the mind why every store in the nation doesn't have this, uh, which is live dry rock, man-made rock, dry rock, whatever. Uh, mind rock that goes into your guys' bins. You make it live. Yeah, you make it live, and you are definitely going to pay for that service. So it is no longer two dollars a pound. You yeah. know, uh, somebody cared for this and uh, got it to the state that you would use it. But now it's going to be way, 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 way easier from day one. Right? Yeah, it's, it's frustrating if we don't use that. Okay. Uh, then there's live rock, which like. If you've been around for a long time, you're talking about your Bali rock, your Fiji rock, your Indonesian yeah. rock. That largely doesn't exist anymore. I mean, it does exist in the fact some of those places will still export it sometimes. There's no demand for it almost. Okay, but you would like be really hard pressed to get it. And it's usually like 15 bucks a pound. Sometimes I've seen it over $20 yes. a pound. Yes, expensive. Uh, very, very expensive. So I... That enters the conversation because we've all been using it for, you know, used it in the, you know, earlier years, but it doesn't really exist anymore. Now there's also still those things like Tampa Bay salt water where they go drop the stuff in the ocean. Uh, now I will tell you that is, for me, it's had the most pests on it. You know, too like, much because yeah. it's, it's not in a reef. Okay. So now all these pests are growing and no one's taking care of those pests. Trust me, I know what you're talking about. I will tell you though, man, was that an easy tank for me. Like, I, that was my first tank. I dropped that Tampa Bay, Bay saltwater rock in there. It came with a bunch of corals and filter feeders and stuff on it. How life. They get sand out of the ocean from yeah. there. It, they gave you this, like, you know, package of stuff. And, like, I, the first couple of days, I could come up there with a light. And you could see the copepod swarm falling around my light. Like, this thing was alive day one. Yeah. Okay. I also was picking out. Yeah, uh, Aptasia and picking out uh, those, uh, those uh, what do you call those shrimp, the mantis shrimp. I was going to say, they the, come with mantis shrimp a lot. Those yeah, ugly Oh, ones. tons of them, man. Tons yeah. of them. The uh, gorilla crabs and stuff. A like, little was, bit of everything. It was the coolest thing ever. I actually saw at one point in time, man, they were in the beginning, and I, I've never seen this again to this day, this crazy looking centipede shoot across a tank. Is this long? Big, yeah. <laughs> like, I never saw it again after that one time, but... Like, you wouldn't get that kind of stuff, but also it was a, it was a crazy yeah. experience. But very easy. Like, this was right for me. It was super duper easy to begin with. To me, the issue that I have when, when they do bring live rock is the way it gets transported. By the time you get it, it's 80% dead. Oh, the, the real, like, individual So Asian now stuff. I have to go through a process of finishing, skimming this rock for the next month or two to all the stuff that it was dying is to finish dying and get out of the rock and now start growing new life. And that to me just creates extra stench, extra work, extra everything, you know? Extra, it, okay, so for a while there, you know, you people didn't know it, but you're buying them like live rock. What you're really buying is rock that was came out of the ocean. scrubbed off. They scrubbed most of the life off of it, came out of the ocean, packed in a box, put on a container ship where it sat in there for a month, then went to some distribution place, sat there for weeks, then got to wherever else. It hadn't seen the ocean in two months. Yeah. Right? Okay. So Walt, uh, Walt Smith's like, I mean, I wish people would buy more air rock. 
And so we set up a program where you could take the rock and you wouldn't scrub it and it would land in LA. And the moment that it hit LA, they would relabel it and then send it to your house. But nobody knew how to deal with it. It had way, way, way too much life on it. Yeah, it little green, little algaes. Yeah, it was corals and sponges and stuff all over it. It was really cool, but most of it was dying because you had to instantly create a world where this yeah. was all going to live. And that is very hard day one in a tank. It's stressful. Yeah. So uh, I will tell you from my own opinion now, I use a lot of dry rock just because it'll, I can create really elaborate aquascapes out of yeah. it. Uh, if you gave me the option of uh, going to the store and I knew that the stuff was relatively pest free and it had been sitting in there for six months, no question. If I was in a hurry, which is almost everybody, yeah. that stuff is going to be a way easier journey in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think anybody would say I do anything different. Have you ever walked into a fish store when they first get that rock and the whole fish store stinks and for the next two or three days? Oh, yeah. I'm so happy we don't deal with that anymore. So about a year ago, Josh and some of the guys from the retail, they convinced me to bring this live rock that some of the vendors was carrying. And I said, you sure? Yeah, we're going to sell it. Someone's asking for it. That rock is still sitting there. Now it's cured. It's just... It's too much. It's the process is too much to get it to. And then we have a warehouse in the building next door and it's attached to one of the offices and the smells start going into the offices. So everybody was complaining. So that's why I told you they didn't want to do this, guys. OK, so that begs a question, too. Like if I want to build, I mean, basically dry, dry rock, you're going to take and build up the biome in there on your own. You're going to figure out how to get the bacteria and the archaea and the copods and all that other stuff on their own. OK. But then the question becomes, would I prefer biome of the sea if I'm going to go live rock? Or would I like the biome of a successful aquarium? Successful aquarium, I was like, because you know what's in yeah. it. Okay, so most people, like, if you didn't really dive into this conversation and you were probably new to this, you would say the ocean, of course. But the ocean comes with the good, the bad, and the ugly, man. Yeah. Uh, the a successful aquarium biome, much more attractive to me. Yeah, you know what's coming in it. For the most part. All right. Uh, next is uh, a need here is a salinity measurement, a way to measure the salt. Uh, you couldn't possibly do this hobby without that. No. Refractometer, salinity pen, and hydrometer. You have a favorite? Refractometer is my favorite, old school. The pen or the yeah. look through guys? Okay. It's what I like. <laughs> we went through this the other day and I got to tell you, I like the little Milwaukee one where you the drop the drops on it. And then like it's, it's the same technology as the uh, looking through it and refracting water. I hit the button and it just tells me I don't have to read it. It's pretty simple to use most of them. OK, I will tell you, though, during that conversation, I hadn't actually we sell this one now, the refractometer when you look through yeah. that has a little LED light in it. Oh, wow. OK, <clears throat> and it's so funny that people like you and me haven't used these things. Okay, I, where was this my whole life? Because uh, you, you couldn't see you have to point at the light. And yeah, you push that little thing down with the light in it, and all of a sudden, man, uh, you can see this is clear as day. It is so, so easy. I think we actually even sell like a little bracket thing that you can take your old one and put this thing on for a few bucks. That's cool. Yeah, super, super easy. Uh, I will tell you though, do you use any of the conductivity pens? They, they've been using them, the guys, at the they? shop. I haven't personally, but they're using them. I <clears throat> am just afraid of them. Yeah. It's just uh, conductivity, man, just hasn't been as reliable really gotcha. as, as measuring the refractometer. Uh, and the other thing is the hydrometers. Those try to stay away from them. They're cheap. They're affordable. Oh, the swing arm ones. You can never get it because there's always little bubbles on it and stuff. They yeah. just read so different. I mean, I guess if you have one, I tell people all the time, if you have, okay, if your salinity is measuring 23, right? And you go to the store and it's 25. Now, don't adjust it. Now you know your 23 is a 25. So you <laughs> I take the swing arm one and throw it in the trash. It's <coughs> yeah. Useless. I they're, would they're never bad. use that. They're better. Now, the, the ones that actually float up and down, uh, if you scoop out water into a tube and float it in there and you're willing to let it settle, this is actually probably the most accurate yeah. thing. But who wants to do all that? Too much work. Nobody. So, yeah. So uh, you need someone to measure salinity. This one's interesting, too. Now, the next one here is uh, things that uh, needs versus want. And you said not always, but a heater needs. And you say here, not always necessary if the tank is large in the, or a large tank in the correct environment. 
also not necessary, oh, but is necessary in a cold region and always necessary if the tank is small. Explain. Uh, well, in Florida, we don't need heaters often, but however, um, we have a dehumidifier into the farm and we have AC. So the AC gets maintained at 74, so there's no humidity and then the tanks go too cold. So then in that case, we do need heaters. If I'm at home and I don't have a dehumidifier, I'm in Florida, I'm not gonna put a heater. You're here in Minnesota, it's not an option. You have to put a heater. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean, depends on your environment, if you need it or you don't. Well, it's interesting because you go to different parts of the country and people have accustomed to a different temperature. So in Minnesota, virtually everyone sets the thermostat to 70 degrees. And so it doesn't matter if it's winter or if it's summer, you know, in the summer, the air conditioning is bringing it to 70. If it's winter, the furnace is bringing it to 70. Okay. So it's pretty much always 70. And our tanks are supposed to be somewhere near approaching 78. It's pretty far away, right? But when I talk to uh, Matthew uh, yeah, from BRS TV, yeah. he lives in Palm Springs. And he's like, dude, we set our thermostat like at like, you know, 78 ish. You know, we live yeah. warm because otherwise our electricity bill would be out of this, out of this world. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, ah, well, I can see why then. If you're maintaining a 76 temperature in your house all the time, the tank probably doesn't need a heat. Yeah. Especially like you said, if it's big, because it's going to take a long time. Yeah, because, yeah, exactly. And you were saying, and what about a smaller tank? If you have a 10, I mean, worse, yeah, I got in my office this, I got a three gallon tank. Even when it gets a little colder than normal outside, that tank is the first one's going to drop. So I have to put a mini heater in there just to maintain the temperature because. Kind of like when you're boiling water. If you're going to boil a small pot of water, you're going to boil it within two, three minutes. Try to boil a 50-gallon barrel. It's going to take you three hours. I would say you got to think about this of, like, what's my household's behavior like, too? Because, yeah, in Minnesota, you can get almost anybody's house 70 degrees all the time. Okay, but if you in your household like a lot to turn off your air or your, or your heater or your furnace and just open up the windows... And some days it's 90 in your house and some days it's 70 degrees in your house. It can, and it can go during, up and down. And then during the day it's 90 and at night it's 70. Uh, this isn't very natural behavior. For yeah, that and that's the problem. I would say this. You can keep the tank at 72. You can keep it at 81, right? But you don't want to be swinging back and forth. Just choose a number, stick with it, and the corals will get used to it. I, I can <laughs> tell you here, like, you don't see things like up and die very fast from being a little bit too cold, right? And there's definitely currents and stuff that are changing temperature in the yeah. ocean too. Is but the heat. I gotta tell you, there are things like, for instance, one time we had a uh, Achilles tang here and he was doing just fine and we we're all super proud about him, you know, cause he, they usually and get egg and all that stuff. That okay, you know what? The power went out uh, on the tank, like the breaker went and then the temperature went, got cold in the tank just for the and one night, one. right? Just the one night, the temperature got down in 70 degrees in here. It didn't get to like, you know, it didn't go down to nothing. Yeah. Uh, and then we turned the temperature back up, went back up. The fish broke out and ick, became patient zero and wiped out everything in the tank. It's funny you say that. I had a very similar issue in, um, in my old farm. Uh, we had two 700-gallon frag tanks. They were huge. And we had uh, one Achilles on each, and we lost power for about two hours. And nothing really happened. We weren't thinking. Both of them broke out and the next day. It's something about when those fish don't have a lot of flow. Mm. It's one of the fish that immediately will just... Okay. So uh, Elliot showed me this video. He was uh, in Hawaii recently and, and uh, he was filming while I was going around. And like, dude, these fish like to live in the most turbulent possible area. Like where the water aggressive is crashing flow. into the rocks, man. Aggressive uh, flow. Yeah. Where they're struggling to go they're picking just that algae. They're all over. That's their preference. They love it. That's yeah. how they get their exercise. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, all right. The next one is uh, you're, you're going to need a way to clean the glass. There are many options, but not are equal. Which one's your favorite here? Magnet. I, I hate to put my hand in there with a the blade. and I mean, I'll do it maybe every two weeks when you're doing a major maintenance, but... Nothing like walking to your tank. Just grabbing the magnet three, four minutes later, you're done with it. Uh, my personal favorite of all of them, because uh, everybody always asks, and it ebbs and flows, uh, but uh, it's definitely the Tunes one that uses real razor blades. So like a lot of the cheaper ones, you'll just use like a piece of metal, you know, and then the piece of metal forms a scraper. 
yeah. with the tunes one you use a real razor blade. And I recently learned there's a real razor blade attachment for the LG free ones too. So if yeah. you bought that, you can add that as an aftermarket thing. But man, with the real razor blade, it could be Coraline LG and you can just go shh, and it just strips it all. I gotta out. check it out because I'm an old school guy. I like the the good old Mac flow. The scrubber? I like the scrubber, man, but the scrubber you you gotta do it every other day or so. You can't let the algae just get too far. If oh, you're yeah. trying to scrub like you're saying, some Coraline, good luck. You'll be there a year. Okay. Not I, one I agree. If you are a frequent one, the scrubby pad side of stuff, if you go and do this every day, it will look great. Yeah. If you yeah. let it go three, four days, it gets just like harder stuff. Yeah. It just like My fear is if the blade is not perfect, you can scratch the tank, and I'm fearful of that. I actually have the opposite fear of that sand granules are going to get it's in the true. scrubby. It's true. I agree. I agree. I can't lie to you on that either. That's... So a lot of, I'm guilty of it, just letting the, the magnet just rest inside the tank. Technically, you should let the magnet rest outside. Yep. Because they start growing those little white barnacles, tube worms, or whatever you want to call them. I don't do that, though. I know. I leave it in. So I uh, uh, that's just... Uh, no, I agree. I cannot agree with that. Yep. You know? uh, the other part I like about the Tunes one is it has these little curved edges on it. So that when you get to the silicone, you can just go up and down and you don't have to like trying to like I'm gonna get check it right it out. up. Yeah. I'm going to try it. Dude, it, it is. Uh, I, I think so much, especially if you don't do this often, because like for me, if you have to go six swipes to clean the area, it is six times harder and six times longer than if you only need yeah, one. I agree. Right. So uh, ultimately here, what people usually use is they use the tunes on the inside and then they use those super strong LG free magnets on the outside, which is the most expensive hybrid solution that you could get, but it's what we all it use works. here. <laughs> and it works. Yeah, because it's cool. super strong uh, and just cuts through all that stuff like butter. But yeah, they're not all the same. Uh, so pick one out. All right, water testing. This is interesting. You're going to need something to test the water. Uh, testing for calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate, if you're not near a trusted LFS or have your LFS touch uh, your water. And I know that you guys, a lot of people do that for you or you do that for them. Yes. So customers come over to our store all the time and we give them a water test. Um, some people just don't want to taste their water, test their water. It is very, very important that you do so. Uh, guessing where your parameters are, it's never good. And by the time, something really is happening, it can be a, it can be an issue. So it's always good to just check the basics. I mean, I like to check alkalinity two or three times per week usually. Mm -hmm. The other ones you can do them once, once per week or so, the calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, nitrates, phosphates, something doesn't creep often. I found that like phosphate and nitrate, I could probably test monthly. I'm just kind of looking for it to not like get out of hand. Yeah, and it, you know? once, you, once you got your own tank and you test enough, you almost start learning the patterns. Mm -hmm. So if you're testing every week for the past two months and every week your nitrous are five. You're just going to stop. Yeah. After a while, you're like, okay, I know what I'm feeding. I'm doing the same water changes. I haven't introduced new animals. Nothing is dying. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing signs of algae. Then you, again, you got to use your intuition, your common sense to say, why am I testing every week? Because I know what the result is. Then you move it to every other week. If you get in the same results every other week, then you move to once a month. Well, it actually kind of ends up doing this. Uh, I've seen this a lot with people is they'll do it all the time every week and then they'll find like it doesn't really change. And they them. leave it alone. Well, then they just stop testing at all because it's zero family. No, you well, can't. Well, no, don't do that. Just like, I mean, test mm. it once a month. You're just making sure that everything's working the way that you thought it was. Because basically with nitrate and phosphate, what you're testing is pollution. Yes. You know, are, is the tank getting more polluted or less polluted? Yeah. Right? Uh, then with uh, uh, elk or magnesium for me especially after you get through the initial cycle once a month is usually good enough for yeah, me. yeah yeah calcium weekly would be good right make yourself not dropping too fast okay alkalinity is the trickiest one yeah. okay this is the one where it, when i started testing weekly the tanks did way way better because i was finding peaks and valleys that i wasn't catching before and and when the tank would start consuming more because the corals are growing i wouldn't catch it as fast yeah Okay, but then uh, for a while on the 160, we were testing alkalinity daily, okay? Huge difference, right? Holy cow, was I in tune with that tank, man. Uh, I mean, I knew every last beneficial and bad thing we did to it. It's the most important one of all. It, it, it will tell you. 
when you crank up those lights a little bit and you tweaked them or expanded the photo period, it will tell you that that was good because alkalinity will drop. Sucks it. Yeah, because it's sucking up more alkalinity because it's doing good things. And if it doesn't like it, alkalinity will actually go up because it stopped sucking things out. Good example of this is uh, fluconazole. Yes. So I've used fluconazole to wipe out bryopsis many, many times. Yeah. Okay. I used to I, too. I've also noticed that, like the corals don't seem to like really hate it, but they also but they're don't not seem to too like happy. It. Especially mushrooms, I noticed they're like yeah. they're like yeah, they shrunk. Okay, but well, the last time when I was paying attention closely to the alkalinity, the alkalinity consumption cut in half. Yeah, because the coral now got a little bit pissed off. Yep. Now right. they don't grow as fast, and there's not something. Well, it's helpful to know that what I did here wasn't the type of thing that I would call poison, but it's definitely irritating them. Yes. Right? Maybe not irritating them as much as the bryopsis was going to overwhelm them <laughs> and is ugly for me, but it gives you that pulse. So uh, that's definitely that. Uh, but if you've got a place to do it, it, like a lot of this stuff from your store, what's cool, especially in the beginning, if you can go to you guys and give you the results, it's not just results but they can tell you what they mean and what you should do about them. Exactly, what adjustments to make based on your results on your water. I, I can't <clears> tell you how many people have stopped measuring phosphate and nitrate because they don't even know what to do with that result. They have no idea, like, I don't know, it goes up, it goes down, you know, what. Yeah. Now you can get actual counsel on what to do with it. Yeah. All right, now we're going to switch into the wants. And there's a bunch of things here that you haven't heard yet. Uh, like, well, I thought you actually needed these things. You do not. Uh, these are just wants. They may want, you may need them or not. Starting with the almighty protein skimmer. Uh, it says here, you have had six extremely successful systems with no skimmer. Uh, maybe save for a better quality skimmer in the beginning because there's clearly no need one need for one in the beginning. Yeah, I mean, we come a long way in, in this hobby. Back in the days, people used to tell you, you need as much light as you can. You need as much flow as you can. You need to skim all day long. The problem now is... Uh, we become a lot smarter at reefing, and these protein skimmers, they became too strong. So, and then we can make water easier nowadays, we can deliver the water easier, and you can get away with water changes by not feeding as much. That's what I mean by having all the information. Um, I feel it's one of those tools that it depends on your own personal habits, how much water you're changing, how much are you feeding, what, are you, what kind of reef are you trying to achieve, but you can do it without, with and without protein skimmer. That's why I say it's, it's not a must, it's a one. If you tell me right now, do example. What about these people with these Pico tanks, five and 10 gallon tanks? They don't have protein skimmers on them. Nope. They're becoming successful. So a lot again, of changes alone. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great tool to have, but it's not, a, it's not a have to, but I do recommend it. <clears throat> okay, so that, like, no protein skimmer at one point would have been blasphemy. If you had said that out loud, people would just stop listening to you. Uh, yeah. because like we, of course you need one of these things. Everybody's got one of these yeah. things. Okay. Uh, that was one of the things that we implemented in the WWC BRS hybrid series is in the E170, no protein skimmer. Only thing we put on there was automatic water changes. Okay. And that tank flourished. No filter socks, no, uh, skimmer, no filtration of any other kind, only dilution, uh, through yeah. water changes tank just took off there uh, you go you awesome. proved it yeah it was like are they are they beneficial can i remove a bunch of uh things from the water and reduce my d need on water changes can i feed more aggressively if i had one yeah but those are all wants not needs yeah i have i had i seen a customer who literally got rid of his protein skimmer because the wife told him this tank stinks too bad because he was pulling so much even with the carbon bag on top so he got rid of the protein skimmer, and did more water change, and problem went away. No more smelly living room. Okay, my wife is complaining too. Uh, she I, complains about that too? Okay, so, the, well, sadly, it's in the next to the cold air return. And so it, like, spreads it throughout the whole house. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, but what, basically, the, when I was looking at this thing, I was thinking about it. And I was like, you know what, man? <clears throat> this cup is basically collecting all the rotten food and poop and out of the tank. sitting there just getting worse. Okay, and <clears throat> worse than that, it's blowing air past the turds into my house. Right, so that's why it stinks, is because there's a fart machine in my house, man. Yeah, and then, and then sometimes the skimming that you get, sometimes it smells, but sometimes it's like, what is this? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So uh, there is a skimmer that has value. It will help a gas exchange. It will remove a lot of stuff yes. from the tank. 
it is not necessary. It's a tool to be used uh, more intelligently. Yeah, what we do too when we have it, sometimes if we feel like we're skimming too much, we just turn it off. So just get one. If you feel like it's too much, just turn it off for a few days. All right, so I'm going to argue with one of this wants thing on sure. this one. But uh, the next one is a dosing pump or a calcium reactor. Just like the skimmer, it's less needed in the beginning. It can be done manually. There are other options like Kelkwasser, and some tanks will never need it if the water changes is consistent. Partially, I totally agree, but also people who set up those dosing pumps, man, and do it right from the beginning, like because they don't have to remember to do it are more successful. Oh, I agree. Again, that's why it's a, it's a, what was the name of the topic? It's like, wants. Do, wants. Mm -hmm. Again, do I want that? It's going to be better versus me remember to put 10 millimeters of each every morning at the same time. And then, oops, I forgot and this and that. So, yeah, of course, it's, it's one of those things. If you can afford it, I definitely recommend it's going to be better. But it's one of those things that if you still have an A and B, you can do it manually. OK, so this is the only I agree that it rides the edge because you can absolutely go up there with your A and B and just dump in 100 milliliters yeah. a day. Right. It, it's nothing preventing that from happening. This is the two things that I find that happen frequently. One is uh, they don't do it uh, every single day because they forget. It's true. Uh, and they also, when I say they, I mean me. Uh, they also will do this uh, like what happens when you go on vacation. Now they just we just let all. You gotta ask your neighbor drop. to do things. I know. Yeah, I agree it, with like that. it's a nightmare. Like you gotta go teach my neighbor how to manage calcium and alkalinity in my tank. Oh, it's not near as effective as a yeah. dosing pump. I mean, if you can yeah. afford a dosing pump, definitely go for it. Then yeah. the worst thing that I have seen is the guy that doesn't test and does the dosing every day, but then skips like kind of three days, and uh, I don't know, the tank looks fine, and he just assumes that this isn't important anymore. And it absolutely is. Uh, and so when you get the dosing pump in there, uh, like it, it just it's consistent. It happens every single day and it's stable and they really don't go wrong very often. Like yeah, I they think, come a long way with uh, these dosing pumps nowadays. Yeah. And so I'm right on the edge between needs and want like right. the, the, the people that use them will have way higher success rates than the people that don't. Yes, I agree with you on that. But if you were to set up a fish tank and you don't have that, you can still make it successful. You That's can what still. I mean by it. You can do it by That's hand. what I mean by it. Is it better with a dozen pump? All day long. If you can afford a dozen pump, if you can afford automation, go for it. I'll come along for the ride. You don't have to have it. Gosh, yeah. I want it so bad. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I guess I'm trying to explain to people... If you really, you're on a tight, tight, tight budget and you really want a successful aquarium, you have to have those those things and the other ones are as a plus. Always extra technology is going to help you. Okay, so that is like, just before it came in your mouth, I was thinking the same thing. Is what, like, you don't have to have it, it's true. Okay, but, like, it is a budgetary equation. Like, all these other things, man, the clean water, the glass box, the lights, the water movement, the return pump, the rock, the salinity measurement, the heater, the glass cleaner, and the water testing were 100% half-to-half. Yeah. Without them, you don't have an aquarium. You're better off investing in the half-to-halves uh, and skipping the dosing pumps and doing it manually until you can afford it. Yeah, and the minute you can afford it, then you're going to become successful. So one of the things when people walk into my store... I try not to sell in too many things because then they it's feel like they spend too much money, they get confused, and then they got all this technology, and then they get out of the hobby frustrated. And my goal is for them to stay in the hobby so they can bring their neighbor, their their wife, their their friends, and they can spread the the community mm -hmm. of this hobby, you know? So I just had an epiphany, <clears throat> actually, now yeah. that you're talking about it, which is, okay, uh, the glass box, all of this other stuff. I could buy a RO system later. I could change out my lights. I could change and perfect my water. I can do the return pump. The rock, I probably couldn't change that easy. Salinity measurement, heater, all that other stuff. If I was really on a strict budget and I had to figure out where to invest, the glass box is the one thing that you'll never change out. No. Like if you, <laughs> if you, you know, make sacrifices here, uh, you'll never be able to fix that. Yes. So would I rather get the right glass box and no dosing pump or the wrong glass box and then get, you know, a dosing pump? 
it's definitely you're right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next one is uh, very common, but also is just a want auto top offs. So evaporation, it can be done manually. Uh, there are options like gravity fed that active systems uh, like ours that can't be used. Been, yeah, very you know, similar to the A and B. Can you do it? Can you do that every day? Yes. However, your level on your sump is not going to be always the same. Therefore, your protein skimmer won't perform the same. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things that do you need it? No, I can I can top it off with literally go with the jug, grab water and just pour into the tank and the tank will be just fine. But it's nice to have a tool like an auto top off. For some people that want to do on a budget, one thing that I do is a floating valve. Mm -hmm. And just suspend a five-gallon bucket, and they just let it feed by gravity. As the water evaporates into your sump, water goes down, kind of like a toilet. It activates your mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. your flow valve, and then just releases water. That's pretty affordable if you know. Yeah, just drill a hole in the side of your acrylic so, sump. We actually have drill bits here that you can drill one in glass even. You have the kit as well, right? Yeah, and then you just put that little float valve in there. And like you're saying, if it's just five gallons... You don't have to worry about it overflowing or anything like that. No, uh, even if it just sticks and you pour an extra few gallons of water in the tank, it's not going to uh, be an inexpensive, easy way to do it. Okay, so for me, there's a couple of things. One, on my first auto top off, or my first tank, which was a 90, I didn't have a sump on it. It was just all hang on. Okay, start. gotcha. Okay, I didn't top that off until the power had sucked in water telling me to top it off. Uh, I just wasn't doing it on a daily basis back then. And so, like, uh, I knew it was That was your to, telling. Yeah. The bubble was like, blowing. Mist and stuff coming out of it. It was telling me, fill the thing back up. What I didn't understand back then is, as I'm evaporating water, the chemistry is always getting more potent. Of course, the salinity is rising. So, yeah. out of the, these things that we said that want, I definitely say that it's borderline between want and need and out of top of and a doser. Can you do it without them? Yes, but you're not going to have the same success like you were saying earlier. It's not going to be as, as accurate. Well, so that's one of the ways that people do this with sumps, too, is uh, if you don't have one, the thing that reminds you is it's all of a sudden the return pump sucking in yeah. air, right? <laughs> blow, bubbles, bubbles everywhere. There, right? you know, the crappier return pumps, they can also burn out that way. You know, yeah. like A, could release bad things in the water, but B, can also just disconnect all your life support from your tank as well. Yeah. Uh, but the difference here is in my 90 gallon tank, for it to do that, I actually had to like evaporate like five gallons of water or something to like go down a few inches. Oh, it's a lot. To happen. In a sump, there's just that little box that the return pumps in, and it can do that in a half a day sometimes. It's you annoying. Know? It is. And then, like you said with the skimmer too, the skimmer is so like susceptible Sensitive. to water changes. That because of the like, pressure that, that it's bringing into the... Yeah, like it deals with head pressure yeah, to fill it up. Head pressure, there you go. Uh, and so when you're dumping in a bunch of extra water to be able to make it last, all of a sudden... Like, Your the skimmer, skimmer spills. It's going all over. It's a volcano. And then when it goes down, it's not working. You pour all that nasty stuff back into the tank. Yeah. So uh, very valuable, but is optional yeah. ATO. Okay, this one's interesting too. Uh, a wants is a refugium or scrubber using algae to get nutrients out of the tank. You say in here, some systems, uh, these are actually the problem. Okay, I wanna hear that one. Sometimes people set up these refugiums thinking it's gonna help them and they don't, they don't maintain it correctly. It just becomes just a, a nasty box full of stuff. And if anything, instead of pulling nutrients out, it's actually adding to the... If you pull out your <laughs> ketomorpha out of there and the bottom's all crumbly and like destroyed... That's what I'm saying. It's decaying right back in your tank. How often have you seen a real refugium working properly? All the time. Yeah. Uh, like for me, it's it, a big around here. For me, it, I'm super heavy into refugiums. Oh, gotcha. Right? Uh, but yeah, you got to change them out. But like for instance, uh, one of our our uh, experiments we did here, we put a cubomyces in every day. Okay, and then at the end of seven weeks, uh, the control had 50 parts per million nitrate in it. With no refugium. Yeah, no refugium. Uh, the other three refugiums, even using the crappiest lights known to man, same zero, amount of food, zero, same amount of food, zero nitrate and phosphate. Wow. The little hang on one with the little five watt crappy LED light on the tack, five nitrate, 90% better. Wow. Right. Okay. What other filter in the tank is going to do that? None. No, no skimmer, no nothing is going to do it that well, man. Right. So, but you do, you have to have it maintained. It needs flow to work. It, yes. You know, it needs light. It, it, like you have to put a little bit of thought into it. Yeah, like a lot of people think it's, oh, just throw a light and just throw some mud in there and just throw some algae and it's gonna work. 
They don't want to trim the grown algae. They don't want to make sure the light is working properly. The flow that is going through is the right flow. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so it becomes more work at times. Uh, I would say the scrubber, man, I'm going to just clean that thing weekly. You know, yeah. the refugium in a can, the reactor stuff, uh, not for me. I've never uh, seen that. So they have like a, a, a reactor refugium. It has a light tube that goes down the center. Oh, right. what's the name uh, of that company? Um, I've seen it. Yeah, uh, Pax Mellon. Pax Mellon. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that was what that was. Oh, yeah. That's, There's that's, so that's, much equipment guys now coming in every day. Uh, <laughs> and so in that thing, though, now i got to, like, take all these bolts out and stuff and, like, check on it and stuff. And, like, it's not, It becomes like, complicated. Then you don't want it. Out of sight, out of mind for me. Yeah. Now, other people might be different. But for me, out of sight, out of mind means uncared for. Yeah. Uh, uncared for means it's not going to work. So. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, it says also, just like the skimmer, it's less needed in the beginning, and eventually, if planned properly, can be the heartbeat of the system. Yes, that's what mm. I was saying. So, it's one of those things that people just don't plan and they throw it in. They think it should work. If you do it properly, I think it's going to work great. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it takes a little bit for that Kato to take off. Yeah. Uh, uh, but once it does, it does. All right. The next one here is a wants is an aquarium controller. Now it says in here, will pay for itself if used right. Just like the skimmer, it's less needed in the beginning, has more functions than just control, monitoring, and fail safes. Okay, so uh, wants, controller, share. They come a long way. If anyone, you can talk more than me about this, the, the technology that they have introduced. I mean, Neptune system, you got the Trident. You got aromatic water changes. You can do it all nowadays. So it's, it's something that you can afford if you want. If you like technology, it helps you a lot. Like you were saying earlier, what do you do when you're on vacation? You can be somewhere in the Bahamas and you can see your temperature. You can see your return pump is stop working. How many people that go on vacation, they ask the neighbor to feed the tank once a day, the return pump start, start stop working. The neighbor's not going to be able to look at your return pump. He's going to see the power head water moving. It's going to tell you everything's okay. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the heater's not working now because the water's not rotating. You come to a half the tank. So I, I really believe it's one of those things that you don't need. But if you can afford, it's definitely something that you do want with all the technology that they offer nowadays. It's just so much you can do with them. So this has changed because when I first met you, like worldwide, wasn't in the controllers. We don't use them. Yeah. Okay. And so when I talked to to Josh, uh, there, you know, I was like, wow, for real, you know. And then like I really thought about it. I was like, you know what? Because I have them here too, right? Yeah. And like all of them aren't, you know, plugged and programmed perfectly, you okay. know, because there's 50 of them. Right? Yeah. Uh, but. That's the same thing in your facility is like, if I have to have all this technology and I got to maintain it and I got to make sure it's all configured perfectly, it becomes kind of like a problem, right? More points uh, of failure. Yeah, if, if, if it's got that many things to do in that kind of environment. But then when I asked him a question, which is like, well, what about just like from a monitoring standpoint? Like from a what? Yeah, monitoring standpoint. Okay. Like, wouldn't you want to know if the pH man was like suddenly 7.5 and the skimmer or the calcium reactor was like going bad or whatever? Like, uh, you know, wouldn't you want to know? It's like, of course. Right. And so that monitoring question is like, would I want to know if the temperature was way off? Do I, would I want to know if the salinity was way off? Would I want to know if there was water flooding somewhere that it shouldn't yeah. be? Would I want to know? The answer is yes across the board and all that stuff. Uh, and like that is where actually like I had the epiphany for like the Apex Junior and we're talking with the Neptune people like what if you're like the people at Worldwide where I don't need to control all this stuff. We got people here to control things. I can control my own tank, but I need to know that the, the problem happened, you know. I feel like a lot of the features on those controllers, they're really good, but there's some basic ones that they're a must and the other ones are just luxuries and some of them are, I will call them gimmicky, some of them, you know. I will tell you this. In my home environment, I love it. I'll trick it out. I'll have it do all the things, everything known to man. Uh, and it's just kind of like part of the gear junkie in me. Like, I just yeah. like technology. And I like the concept of redundancy. And I take vacations. And I work really long hours. And, like, it's it, it fits me. Right? Funny. I'm the total opposite. Okay. All right. But uh, in the work environment, I don't have that much time to throw at every single one of these things. Systems, yeah. Make sure they're working correctly. So, nuts. 
the monitoring piece ends up being the like we we put basic control on all of them and then we put monitoring on all of them for sure because we need to know and we say this all the time but like that these things save about one tanky here uh, about every month which oh, sounds sure. like, uh, sounds absurd actually You're like once a month come around on. here because there's so many of them well if you think about it though that like it's because you have so many tanks if you do it at your uh house that means it'll save your tank you know, roughly every few years. Yeah. Okay. Because this stuff is inevitable. You're going to have a temperature problem. You're yeah. going to have a, a, a return pump failure. You're going to have something leak. You're going to yeah. have all the glass box might start leaking and you don't realize that until it's missing water and you got water on the floor. Okay, the water thing. level got too high and skimmers volcanoing all over the place. You know? That's a cool, that's okay. a good one when it shows off the skimmer. That's a real nice feature. Where yeah. When everything turns back on, it's delayed the protein skimmer. Mm -hmm. That's one of the features I like a lot. Well, like, and that's where the, like, the fun, the hobby part of it comes into it for me. Like, I pro take the time to program it, flip the switch, and one switch, you know, from Adaptive Reef turns off my skimmer, turns off my uh, UV, turns off the power heads, turns off the return pump, turns off the lights, turns off everything that I want to turn off during a water change. Uh, and then when I'm done, I flip the switch back on and it turns all of it on, except for the protein skimmer, which it waits uh, about 10 minutes to turn it back on until everything's yeah. stabilized. Like, that's just fun and cool. Yeah, that know? took a few years to figure out. I used to hate that, man. Every time there was a power <laughs> outage, like, no. Yeah, because the skimmer goes crazy after the power outage. It turns right? on together, the water's too high, and it starts yeah. spilling all that uh, nasty stuff and, back in the tank. And in a sump area, it's not just spraying out of there. It's spraying out exactly where, like, your electrical stuff is. Yeah. You know? Like, this is bad news. Yeah, it is. Uh, so, cool. Uh, the next want, uh, or, uh, yeah, wants, is a UV. Yeah. Now, this one kind of gravitated from, like, for me, 15 years ago, from uh, almost nobody really even wanted and now it becomes a more heavy want, but. So funny you say that. So I've never been a big into UVs until about maybe seven years ago. We started using them into our store. And most recently, if you guys seen my YouTube channel, I've been doing a series with my 80 gallon tank that I've been setting up in my office. And I lost two batches of fish. Mm -hmm. I was moving a little too fast and I didn't have a UV um, reactor and the rocks were dry and I moved too fast. So I lost both batches of fish, no proud of it. And then I added a UV sterilizer. My water became crystal clear and I never lost another fish. This was overnight. I mean, I'm, last batch of fish, I lost it. I waited 30 days, put the UV, threw a whole new batch of fish. I think the clowns got a little bit of egg, minimal. Within three, four days, like nothing ever happened. So I've been a big believer as of lately, especially for water clarity and for fish, for keeping fish. I, I've <clears> seen a couple of things for it. One is as cool, especially on a bare bottom tank where you're likely to run into bacterial blooms and stuff in yeah. the beginning, bare bottom dry rock, I should say. Uh, dude, you could be fighting that bacterial bloom forever or you could turn your UV on and it could be gone tomorrow. Okay. Right? Uh, I've also seen it with many forms of dinos that people run into. The type that dissipate at night and go into the water column and then recollect back a, a, a in the morning when the lights turn back on. So annoying. Gone, they're just gone. You turn on the UV, this battle you've been fighting for the last three months, gone, single yeah. day. Okay, then in tanks like this for uh, the uh, uh, fish disease and stuff, how often do you see a powder blue get ick and recover from it without any effort? Not often. Not often. Here, we, uh, powder blue gets ick. It's dead. This tank 100% has ick in it, right? right? Put the UV on, signs of ick go, do, go away. Now, if the, if the fish are overwhelmed, you know, just covered in ick, it may get a Yeah, fish, that's the different right? course. But... The way that the UV works is it reduces the total population of things that can reproduce. So the, the ick that's in the water column, right? Yeah. So if you can, the fact, if that fish can manage for the next couple of weeks where all of a sudden the ick falls off and goes into its reproductive stage, yeah. gets sucked up by the water or the UV, the UV. and it gets processed so it, it can reproduce. Up. And then the ones that hatch the same way. Well, now the overall population goes way down. And in, in a generally healthy system, the UV will prevent that from happening. And so in a world where I've found that people just aren't going to QT the way they're supposed to, no matter what we say, no matter how we say it, it's never going to happen. Uh, and like they don't like paying for it either in many yeah. cases. Uh, and the reality is even QT, 
It's like you have to QT every last drop of water, every snail, every That's crab, and like whatever. Like it's not real. No. So how do we manage the fact? And I've just seen it enough times now that if you use UV installed the right way with the right size and right flow rates, like fish disease is probably not your problem. No, I'm telling you, I, I experienced it recently and I'm a big believer now. Okay, and there's a lot of people uh, like yourselves, which if I asked you 10 years ago, you would have said garbage. I wouldn't say garbage. Um, my approach, like I was saying, I'm different than you. I like, when I, when I do aquariums, reefing, I like it super simple. The less equipment, the less points of failure. What worked for me 10, 15 years ago continues to work today. The guys make fun of me at the shop. I like to keep it super simple, super old school. It works for me. So it's not that I think it would say garbage. It's hard. Every time you introduce new equipment to me personally, I'm going to have my big doubts about it because I say, like, why do I need it? If it's, if it's, it's not broken, don't fix it. Okay, so I'm going to interject a weird yeah. one in here. I've shared this story a couple of times now, so bear with me, but... Like, okay, I feel the same way about a lot of technology. Like, I just kind of doubt it. And, like, ozone was one for me, right? Okay, I'm going to tell you that 360 tank that's in my office has been the bane of my existence. It has had so many problems, man, that I've never had with other tanks. That Like, why would I have these things 20 years in after doing this? Why, yeah. why this one? I don't know. I still don't know the answer exactly. But... uh uh, it's ebbing and flowing with dinos and diatoms. And I can I know that's both those things because I'm looking at it through the microscope and it's going up and down. And I'm getting slimes all over the place and mm -hmm. whatever. Okay. One day, I turned the ozone on out of guidance from a friend of mine, right? And I turned it on to the lowest possible setting on the thing. And I only turn it on for two hours a night. Okay, I do it on Friday. I come back on Monday. All that crap is gone. Gone. Doesn't exist. I've been dealing with this for 18 months, man. Wow. Right? Gone. Okay. After a couple of weeks, I turn it off. It comes back a little bit, like almost immediately, but it just it doesn't come back with the same vengeance, right? I turn the thing back on, goes away. I turn it off like a month later, never comes back. So this thing, man, that I've been fighting for eight years or, or for 18 months or more, I think all of a sudden, like a switch, dude, turns it off. Now, we're still exploring this. Don't go run out and do all this stuff. Yeah. But like, like, this is a thing where you try it and you're like, oh, now I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And now I know why. I'm that way, man. I mean, usually Josh is the one who's always getting me into new stuff. And I said, look, I don't mind trying stuff. Let's do one at a time. We got to be very meticulous. Let's check it out. That's why we don't use many controllers in our farm. And that's why now I'm introducing some UVs. And it just, again, I'm very uh, hesitant to try new stuff because it's been working for us for so long. You know, one of the stories I heard about ozone actually was, you know how like we were talking about dipping corals in a different episode where you dip it in the hydrogen peroxide and yeah. then all the algae gets off the off the frag and just goes away. Yeah. Right? Okay. I've heard of, of maintenance companies installing ozone on their systems that have those like kind of uh, fake coral systems in there that like look great day one, but after a while. Yeah, yeah, you have to algae. replace them every something. You know what they do? They have ozone in the systems and when they look like crap, they just turn the ozone on and then the ozone gets rid of the algae and then they just turn it off. They don't even clean it, man. So the ozone strips all that just, algae just, down. Yeah, and like you could argue whether or not, I don't know like how harmful that is to the animals that are in there, but there's some kind of value in here that we can figure out how to use these things safely. But like once you understand like how they're using it, like holy cow, man, because yeah. that's one of the main complaints of those, those uh, you know, coral inserts. They look great day one, but then they look dirty and ugly and like crap later. I hate those things. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. The next one in here is auto feeder, a want to have, right? Uh, not necessary, uh, but it can be a, a problem versus a solution. Needs to be set up right. Yeah, it can, it can be very uh, useful. Um, I like to eat, I'm sorry, I like to feed multiple times per day. Mm -hmm. Three, five, six times per day. And if you're not home, how are you going to do that? And the problem, we get home at nine, we feel like the fish hasn't been eating. We dump a bunch of food. They eat a quarter of it. The other quarter is going down the overflow. The other half is going down into the rocks. And then you get a problem versus if you were to have a out of feeder, especially put a little ring on top so the food actually goes into the water. You could get that feeder to feed once per hour, like little amounts. And I think it's a lot better. But again, it's one of those want. If you don't have one, you can feed with your own hands and you'll be fine. But I, you're most likely to overfeed. You're going <clears> to <throat> up your filtration game or your yeah. dilution game. Uh, but dilution. <laughs> I'm going to go to 
mostly want, sometimes need. So need in the essence of what if I put some fish in there that are super high energy that need to be fed all the time? Yeah, then, then it will be a, a, a must have. Yeah, because those antheas and stuff are just going to die if you yeah. don't do this, right? And they don't just die. We're starving them to death. Uh, yeah. And like it was this mentality of old of eh, fish only need to be fed every couple of days or day other day. Some do. Predator fish. They're yeah, no ambush antheas. predators. Yeah. No antheas. No, they yeah. three, four times a day and, and not just protein. Yeah. So when I think about it, uh, like when I went and saw your facility and you see the little timers going off and people are feeding by the hour, every hour yeah. on time, every time, right? Yeah. Okay. I totally get the wisdom of this. Small amount of food all the time. But don't, I'm at work. Can't do that. It's impossible. That's true. So if you do have those antias, it's a must to have. A, and an auto feeder can be fairly affordable. Yeah, they're, they're pretty I'm expensive. Saying. Uh, so one of the things I think about is a, so putting an auto feeder with a, like a Kalanis or really small pelleted food from like TDO or something in there that can feed the, some of these fish throughout the day. Uh, but also like, if you look at your yellow tangs and stuff like that, they, all they do all day long Grace. is eat algae. Right. And if your tank is clean and doesn't have a lot of algae in it, well, maybe we should be feeding algae throughout the day. And so that's one of the things I did with the uh, Mora Scheidel that's in there. Like all he told me is, man, feed the uh, high fibrous food. Uh, uh, and He's been happy. Yeah, it does just fine. It was one of the easiest to take fish I ever had. Yeah. I was told that you, uh, like up until that point, I believe you should not have this fish. Oh, wow. Well, like, uh, why? It's, you want to feed the easiest, right. easiest <laughs> thing I had. It's doubled in size since I've had it. You know? So uh, auto feeder, I think. Sometimes can be about vacations and sometimes about like, you know, maybe I just don't want to feed it or whatever. Sometimes like a necessity as well, depending on the animals you have. Similar to the doser and to the, mm. yep. To the, uh, what's the other one that we mentioned? Um, uh, well, doser, skimmer, auto top off, refugee auto top scrubber. Off. Yeah, Those, um, similar to the mm. doser, auto top off. Can you do it without them? Yes, you can, but you'll be better if you get those few items. So those mm -hmm. are few that I, like, I would call them in between. You know, one of the things I'm hoping that, that people come out with is a way to, you know, now they like have Kalanis and they have uh, uh, like Mysis and stuff in liquid form, like Nios has it. Uh, can we get a method of using a doser to dose that stuff? Because the powdered like Kalanis and powdered foods are sometimes kind of hard, like you need that feeder ring and stuff. Yeah. What if I could use like the liquid foods? Uh, that would be amazing. Uh, yeah, man. It's almost like, I think of the difference between like like dog food and cat food. There is like the stuff that comes in that bag, you know, that dried stuff that doesn't look anything like what they would normally actually eat. Then there's stuff that comes in a can that's shelf stable. Yeah. It's kind of like meat-ish, right? A little bit of everything. Okay, so this is what I'm thinking is uh, like the liquid foods that come in a doser, meat-ish. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, uh, it's protein and it's shelf stable. Uh, and then there's frozen foods, which are kind of like now when you go and grab it, get a chicken and drop it in the blender, uh, yeah. you know, people doing raw foods. But you also, it, you got to be clean with it. It goes in your fridge and all that other stuff. And that's why some people don't really do freeze frozen foods because of the hassle. What if these liquid foods, man, they could be, be the cool. thing. Like uh, some people put the little fridge with the Apex controller and well, they, they poke their fridge yep. with a line and they... they the live food they're putting. People do that with uh, uh, live foods. They yeah. do it with amino acids and stuff. But one of the things that I talked to uh, one of the people at NIOS, and it says in the bottle that it's like uh, after opening should be refrigerated. Okay. They're like, but if you properly sterilized all the tubing and everything, uh, it probably doesn't have to be. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so there's a little bit of work to be done, I think. And we all got to kind of prove this stuff out. But uh uh, I think that I could be done. Cool. I have a cool way of doing it. Uh, next one you said uh, nice to have is a roller mat. They came out a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I think they're great. It, it can add another point of failure too, but they can over clean the tank. They're I'm gonna, too effective almost. I'm going to fit filter socks right in sure. with nice to sure. have. Sure, you too. don't need them. You're you know, right. like, or I want to have. Like you can absolutely have a tank without filter socks. Yeah, you don't. But those roller mats, um, they work fantastic. You're using one over there. Uh, you know, you took I, it offline at one point, yeah. if I remember correctly. Yeah, I refuse to change out the filter socks every three days. 
And if you don't change out the filter socks every three days, the water goes through the tub. Then you yeah. gotta. It's like you you reversing what you're doing. You're collecting it and now sitting concentrated there where everything you flows through. It. Yeah. yeah, it's like well, everything's gotta go through. I agree. Okay, you know what I actually found was after you pull out the filter socks, the skimmer performs better because it's capturing all this crap that the skimmer. You get would have the skimmer just out. to get it out. Yeah. Yeah, and so instead of letting my skimmer work. If I just put those filter socks in there, and if I don't change them, like if you're the kind of person that just lets them be in there until they overflow, yeah. all you're doing is creating a pollution factory because the skimmer would have pulled some of this out. I wish you would see my tank of mouth is no filter socks right now. They uh, last two, because water bugs give you these little filter socks. No, no pun intended, I hate that. I want the bigger ones if mm -hmm. I were to use some. So those things last a day or two, so guess what? I just took them out. Yeah. and then. I wish that more sumps were designed without filter socks because I would not use them, right? Yeah. And, and so now the, this is a holistic approach. So if I had a, a tank that had a uh, refugium that was well cared for in it uh, and nitrate and phosphate ain't my problem, I'm not using filter socks or the rollover mat because actually all that particular food that's in the, in the water and the poops and all the decaying stuff, I'd actually allow my corals to capture and eat. Right. I, 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 all I really care about is the end game pollution of nitrate and phosphate. Yeah. So if I have a different solution for that now, if I don't have a skimmer or, a, or if I don't have a scrubber, I don't have a, a refugium, I'm not carbon dosing and all the other stuff. Yeah. Well, now I need to actually reduce the pollution uh, yeah. up front so it doesn't end in the end. Yeah. And uh, so it's how you build all this stuff collectively together and think about it uh, in, in a holistic approach. OK, the next one is reactors. This is actually a whole bunch of different things. Carbon, GFO, PO4 media, sediment uh, filters in the reactor, all these different things, optional. Let's just start with the carbon, optional. Uh, carbon is one of those things that it helps you clean the, clear the water, which you can do with ozone, UV, protein skimmer, filter socks, water changes, the filter uh, mats. Um, I feel like it's not needed. I feel like it's a plus. It's nice if you want your water clear to clear. Some people change it too often. Me, I personally feel if you're gonna add carbon, replace it once a month. I use it. Uh, in a, I used to use it all the time, like 24/7. It was always running. Uh, I and I used to use it in reactors and all that kind of stuff. I, I now use it in a bag. I yeah, they're it, not as effective on the uh, bag, but sometimes it's better. It don't care that it's not effective because I don't want it to work right away. That's what I was saying. Yeah. Sometimes it's too effective, the karma. You can strip too many things out. I don't need it to instantly be effective. I just need to notice that the water is too yellow for me or stinks or some reason like that. Yeah. Uh, and I throw some carbon in the bag. I'll throw it in the baffles uh, of the sump. And within the week, it, it is crystal clear again. Yeah. The reactor will make it crystal clear within three hours. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and so... Uh, for me, that's where I'm at. I'm actually edging now towards using a small amount of ozone every day instead. Yeah. Uh, and then just keeping it crystal clear all the time uh, without the, the carbon at all. Yeah, just another way to clear the water. And then talking about general reactors too, GFO reactors, these biopellar reactors. There's all kinds of reactors used to help you deal with the nutrients issues in your tank. But I feel like they're not necessary. I feel like, like you said, I can get a little bag and just throw it right inside my filter sock if i if i'm using one i'm gonna actually say i'm gonna go out on a limb here yeah. and say not only are they these reactors for media and stuff not necessarily necessary they are actually really poorly designed because so many of them are designed for gear junkies so you have more gear and more stuff and they're cool and they're big but like why do i need a reactor this big for a carbon that i'm gonna use a half a cup for Funny you say that, man. I'm always saying that because I want you to buy more carbon and pour more in there. Like, I have no idea why you need that thing. In fact, and then it's designed to like tumble it because it looks cool. And then you tumble the carbon in, it just turns to dust. You know, yeah, like, that I can't stand, man. Oh my gosh, when you clean and just get all that black stuff coming out. No, thank you. So I think that's one of the reasons why like the BRS reactor has always been so successful is because, it, you know, it's just repurposing a car. I don't like know a, what it looks like. It's just repurposing a... Uh, um, like a RO canister, right? Okay. And so like with most <laughs> reactors, if I want to change the media, I got all these tubes and all these little nuts yeah. and crap and like I'm dragging all this stuff to the sink to clean it out. And because of that, I never do it, right? 
Okay, with the BRS reactor, it's just you unscrew the water canister and it has a little cartridge in there with a couple of sponges that hold your half a cup of carbon at the top. It. Call it the and day. just bring it to the sink, dump it out, man, it's done. And then I screw it in, there's no tubes, there's no nothing. It is like that easy. I think that is why that has been like, I mean, if, if we were gonna look at all the reactors for media that we sell here, uh, that one for the other mm -hmm. one, I, I bet you it's- It's more man, effective. Like, no, like 97%. You could pile all the other ones here that we sell on top of each other, and I bet you it doesn't make up more than 5%. Funny to me, like, that there's not enough um, design, people designing these things to become more effective, but then you got something like, a, I seen this protein skimmer from Coreview that has got, like, a gyre pump or, like, two pumps or something mm -hmm. like that. It's mind-blowing to me that they're still trying to spin the wheel on a better protein skimmer. I can name 10 protein skimmers that I will pull stuff out of the tank, like, if it's going out of style. So I don't understand why you need to pull more. We almost the if you leave this protein skimmers, if it's oversized and you leave it on all the time, you're not feeding, you don't have enough fish, you're gonna strip down your tank to nothing. It's gonna be too clean. So it's just I don't you know. You know what's funny? <clears throat> the the uh, uh, you're talking about the Max Spec Gyre protein skimmer that yes. has two has yes. one pump with two things on it. I, I didn't know this, but I like because I also thought like why is that necessary? What I, when I saw it though, I was like. Oh, that's cool. Because you know what a recirculating skimmer looks like, right? You have one feed pump, and then you have one pump inside of it that's making all the bubbles up. Never pay attention, but okay. Okay, so the recirculating are kind of old. Uh, okay, but like basically, if I only have one pump feeding the skimmer, uh, then it's fighting the head pressure inside, right? And that's why it goes up and down or whatever. Okay, with the gyre one, basically there's one pump head on the inside that's creating the foam and mixing it up and okay. top it. And then the other one on the other end can be configured to be the feed pump to control the water level in it. Mm. So it actually doesn't have some of the same problems that we've talked about with water level inside this pump. And it has even more bubbles top to bottom. So after I looked at it, I was like, oh, this is actually an innovation in yeah, this. I'll but have to like, check it out. Also, you know, you know one of the interesting things about why people don't innovate protein skimmers all that much? Because you don't see it? Is because a lot of the skimmers you see are the same ones you seen five years ago, right? Even 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's zero skimmer upgrade market. Zero. Nobody takes their old skimmer and goes and buys a new one. Nobody yeah, takes unless it. Unless it's some really people, old school generic skimmer. People yeah. do it with return pumps, <laughs> flow, lighting, all this stuff. Nobody does it with their uh, with their skimmer. And so there isn't a lot of innovation happening there because there's like not a, money, yeah. a lot of money flowing into it. But like some of these things could be way done way better than they're done. So gotcha. uh, on, be... on that one, I can see like I don't mind when people are getting new technology to try to solve a problem. If you if you're right, how you're saying that those two pumps wants to regulate the level and the other ones for the bubbles, then I can see the value in it. But I see people just making these protein skimmers real gimmicky. And I'm like, what's going to make it pull out more waste? Now it's different. They're trying to make it to 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 create a solution for a problem, which is the, the level of the mm -hmm. skimmer. That I can understand, you know? So this is one of those things where I would say I'd go back to is it is you said early on, man, uh, with the skimmer, maybe save for a better quality skimmer in the beginning because there's clearly no need one for one right there. So that is a good point. It's like, because there's not like, nobody wants to take the $300 skimmer they bought, throw it in the trash and replace it with a $600 yeah. one, right? And the $600 one will work way better and they'll have functions like this. You'd be better off just skipping the first one, running without for a while, Until you and get then the buy right the, one. like the d nice ones. And the DC ones are really cool. So one of the one of the things that we found in our experiments was basically the way that a skimmer is working is it's a foam engine, right? Yeah. And like a gasoline engine, you're mixing a gasoline engine. You're mixing you know combustible fuel with air, and if you get either one of those things off, it no longer works. It has mm. to be a specific ratio. So the same thing with the foam is like, think about when you're blowing a bubble. You know, if I gave you a little can of bubbles, if you blew it, it's pretty easy, right? Now, what if I dilute that solution by half and with water? I could still blow a bubble, but I gotta blow it super gentle before it pops. Because yeah. there's very little organics in there. Yeah. If I dumped in twice the soap, now the problem is, is it's just gonna blow tons and tons of bubbles. It's gonna be super easy. Okay, same thing in your a tank is the, the amount of organics to the amount of air that's in there is we found that if you have very little organics in there, you can't produce a skim at, at all. Uh, unless you turn down your DC pump to blow way less air. 
and the low velocity of air now allows that foam head to build up. And then what we found is if you have just dump food in, well, now we can put tons of air in there using the DC pump to spin it up, yeah, just the, you know? Now, what the net of this means is that means a DC pump skimmer means I can use it when I only have three fish in the beginning. I can turn it down really low for the low amount of organics. And then- Never thought about it that way. That's pretty cool. And the skimmer then will travel with me. Then later on when I have 20 fish in there and I'm feeding can, the hell can, out of you it- You can create more waste out of it. Create them, more air to match more organics, create the right foam. Funny you say that, because when those skimmers, yeah, I told you, I don't like new technology. When they first came out, the only thing that I can see, now I got two points of failure. Yeah. Well, I got my controller as a point of failure. Now I got my pump as a point of failure. Before, mm -hmm. I only had a pump as a point of failure. That is an interesting uh, perspective. Oh, right? that's everything that I think. I'm telling you, I have yet to crash a tank. So the reason no, that... No, you got wood somewhere here? <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason that like I go DC before that was because I wanted to avoid the... Mm, gotcha. You know, the AC pump on it, like the noise and stuff. Gotcha. I, the DC pump just eliminates the noise. Uh, but I got good news for you. We have more where all of this is coming from. We've done the wants, we've done the haves, and there's another playlist here of all the stuff. Victor, join us, sharing all of his knowledge. You can check it out here. Thank you, guys.